Welcome back, my friends, to Sonic Perspectives, and we're on the road to Prague stock. And our next stop on the road to Prague stock is an interview with Dave Kersner talking about his new band In Continuum and how they'll be playing at Prague stock 2018. This interview is conducted by one of our authors, contributors, and interviewers, and a good friend of mine here at Sonic Perspectives, Mr. Scott Medina. Hello, this is Dave Kersner, and you're listening to Sonic Perspectives. Scott Medina for Sonic Perspectives, and this interview with Dave Kersner is part of our series entitled On the Road to Prague Stock. Prague Stock is a progressive rock festival held in Rahway, New Jersey on the first weekend of October, and tickets are on sale now. This is the festival's second year in existence, and also the second year in a row to feature Dave Kersner. So, although this year Dave will be fronting his brand new band called In Continuum. So, Dave, welcome to the call. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. After a few spectacular years, it looks like Dave Kurtzner band's going to be on hold for 2018. And instead, this is the year of your new project in Continuum, right? Yeah, I mean, sort of on hold. I, I'm still uh, doing some of the last of the Static tour for my solo album Static. I were playing in England um, this summer. And uh, I'm actually uh, here and there working on a static volume two follow-up. It's maybe not what people expect. It's a bit more avant-garde and artsy, uh, but sort of stemming from some material that was written around the time of static uh, with Fernando Perdomo uh, that we're, you know, Fern and I are working on that. We also have another side project, but uh, that's kind of back burner. So yes, at, at the forefront is uh, in continuum, um, Oh, there's also my live album, Static Live. So Dave Kersner solo stuff, still in progress, actually. But uh, in terms of new music that's being, uh, you know, that will be sort of a heavy focus for, of course, Prague Stock uh, performance there, which is our debut, and then Cruise to the Edge uh, next year. Uh, that's, you know, both are going on in parallel, but... It, it, in Continuum is pretty heavy because I've got a lot of stuff going on there. Right, right. And In, in Continuum features an all-star cast. So could you go through the members of the band and let us know if this lineup is set in stone or is this more of a rotating cast with you being more the primary leader? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's both, but it's really mainly a rotating cast uh, with me as the ringleader, I guess you could say. Um, the, um, I, I've just come to the conclusion that, it, uh, bands, at least in my experience, need someone to be the, uh, uh, director of it, you know, sort of taking the reins and a captain of the ship, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be me. I'm actually, I enjoy being in a band where there's a really strong captain and he's leading the way. That's how it was when I played in Kevin Gilbert's band. He just... He booked the gigs and, and he, you know, would write the songs and, and we would just be lucky to kind of be part of it. I like that. I enjoyed playing with him. Uh, that would have been cool. Actually, I would have wanted to be more creatively part of it and collaborate with him. Uh, he didn't really need anybody for the songwriting. But uh, so it's nice when, you know, when it's a project like that. But uh, what's great about the projects I do where I'm the head of it is I, I do most of the writing and the producing and can kind of just cast different people to do different parts if I have that flexibility, which you don't really have in a band, especially even if you're, you know, let's say if someone's busy and their schedule doesn't allow, you can move around that. Whereas if it's a set band, you have to wait until they're done and, the, you know, things can take years. Um, so, uh, but anyway, the, the cast is incredible. Some of the people I've worked with before, like Nick DiVirgilio, who actually I played with in Kevin Gilbert's band, and he's worked with me on my solo stuff. Randy McStein, uh, guitar player, multi-instrumentalist, uh, who played with us in Sound of Contact, uh, but also I worked with him on his Lo-Fi Resistance project. Uh, Matt Dorsey, who is the only other 
remaining member of Sound of Contact with me, even though uh, we've sort of put that on the you know indefinite hiatus, I guess, since uh, two members left the band. And uh, and actually, that's how this project was born because I had a lot of leftover material that was intended for Sound of Contact that was never going to be released as Sound of Contact. So I created this band as a home for that, as a, the, the initial impetus for it. Uh, there's uh, Gabriel Agudo, um, which, you know, in that sense, this being that type of band where my role is more, uh, less less the front man and more of the production and keyboard and songwriter. Uh, and I, I would be actually the second lead vocalist in the band. And Gabriel Agudo, uh, who's going to be here in a few days, is the main lead vocalist. Mm. Uh, but similar to uh, Sound of Contact, although... I didn't. I did a lot of the backing vocals, but I didn't really do as many uh, sort of secondary lead vocals as I would have liked. Uh, so now that the project, this project, is under my control or whatever, I, I have that opportunity. Which you know, I've liked bands like Pink Floyd, where they have multiple vocalists. The Beatles, Alan Parsons Project. Uh, there might be one person, you know, like Eric Wolfson in that Alan Parsons Project would be like the guy you hear the most or Gilmore and Pink Floyd, or let's say Supertramp, you know, or the Beatles, well, the Beatles are pretty even in the mix, but, you know, so I like that. And also as a guest vocalist, we have John Davison from Yes. We have John Wesley on guitar from Porcupine Tree, who also played with Sound of Contact. And Steve Rother is a special guest, but he's just doing like one cameo solo. So everybody's, and, and then on drums, we have also Marco Miniman, who I've never worked with before, and I love working with him. We've been extremely prolific, great flow, great, you know, just camaraderie. Uh, I've been a big fan of his uh, since I saw him playing with Stephen Wilson. Uh, just an amazing drummer. So two great drummers. I couldn't be happier. With, the drums are incredible on the record. And, mm -hmm. and then, you know, just other people. Uh, Letitia Wolf plays a character. Uh, she's a female vocalist, multi-instrumentalist, who I worked with on Shaming of the True uh, show that we did uh, in 2000. 12 honoring Kevin Gilbert uh, with Nick DiVirgilio and a bunch of great people that played with Kevin. So it's quite a cast, uh, but there's a lot of recurring players and that will be playing with us live. Uh, and I'm working on multiple albums, so they'll be on both albums. So it is kind of a core band, but you know, you've got, let's say two, one of two different drummers, one of two different guitar players, you know, you never know. And whether they'll be there live or, you know, on this album or that album. It depends. It's flexible, but yet there's some consistency. Yeah, yeah. Did I hear also that you and Gabriel are doing different, your voices are different characters in the album? Yes, everyone's voice is a different character. I play more of the, it's a concept album, and it's actually a series of concept albums that relate, like, sequels and prequels. And um, So the, the first two... And, and, of course, this can change, uh, but the plan at the moment, I should say this, because sometimes I say stuff and then I'm like, oh, we changed that, actually, and now it's this. Right. But uh, for the moment, it looks like it's going to be um, a uh, two albums that are sequels, you know, basically a story that relates, uh, and the first one will be released at Prague Stock, which is exciting. Um mm -hmm. And the second one, uh, early next year, uh, sometime, um, and and they, it's the same story, uh, but uh, within that there are different characters. I, I play this sort of uh, narrator actually, uh, talk, sort of speeding the story along because, um, you know, obviously in a concept album with only so many songs, you know, there's there's just events that have to happen uh, that need you know a story to be told. So. Um, I, I sort of play that role, especially because I'm writing all the lyrics for everything, which I, I tend to do, mm -hmm. write most lyrics or all the lyrics, and I, that's, I'm, that's my comfort zone. So, um, but Gabriel plays the main character. Uh, Letitia plays his love interest um, from another world, huh. uh, without giving too, away too much. Yeah. And uh, so it's a cross, you know, planetary uh, affair. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, and then John Davison uh, plays an ethereal character uh, from this other world. Um, 
vocally and then uh, whether he realizes it or not <laughs> actually one of the songs i wrote with john anderson and he just wrote the melody and we didn't get we didn't get to the point where we would write the lyrics yet and then when i told him the concept because i wasn't sure if he wanted to write it and i told him the concept and, and he was just like and i thought it would be up his alley actually because it's really kind of cosmic and out there yeah but he was just like uh, you do it. You you write it. It just lists me as a songwriter. No, he, <laughs> you surpassed him for for cosmic writing. That's pretty cool. I, I asked him just because I offered it, and and he was gonna guest on it. Um, but he's busy with other stuff and just wasn't sure what to do really. And uh, and I didn't want to push it. So it's cool to just to have co-written a song with John, and he sings on the demo. But uh, but ironically, I'm gonna have the person who sings in Yes. The other yes, sing it because it is John Davison's a friend of mine, and we've been wanting to work together on stuff. And he has, you know, the other thing is that there's very few people who have that kind of range right. uh, voice up there. So he's got this really great ethereal voice that would be perfect for that character. And um, Randy and Wes uh, maybe singing on it, and and, and Matt um, doing different characters. They're all great singers. Yeah, so they got great voices. Might as well opportunities to utilize them yeah we're going to try to blend our, our backing vocals as well so mm. that when we play live it sounds you know kind of like the, the record oh that's gonna be great and i've seen you mentioning in concert that you might do some older sound of contact material and, and i know some of these songs for in continuum were originally going to be on the next sound of contact album but it, it sounds like you know again without you giving away much of the of the plot at this point it sounds like what you're describing would would mix in well with some of those songs from the first Sound of Contact album, like Beyond Illumination and those kind of tracks. Oh yeah, stylistically, it's like um, I would say In Continuum is like a cousin mm -hmm. uh, or a brother of Sound of Contact stylistically. I mean, it's different because people like Randy and uh, Marco. Uh, especially, and, and Nick, you know, and, and Gabriel, I mean, they're just different. They bring their own sort of uh, style and, and technique and things uh, and ideas to it. So, um, you know, and, and then vice versa, uh, you know, Simon and the guys from Sound of Contact have their sort of uh, characteristics, and, uh, you know, character to their playing and whatnot. Um, but... These would be, let's say, songs of mine or some, some of the songs I've collaborated with, let's say with Matt or Simon, but um, but primarily my songs, and they have their songs. That's how we kind of split it up. People, we took our songs back and finished it with other people mm -hmm. uh, recording them. Um, so it's got a lot of, like, a thr it, it sounds like Sound of Contact, but like on steroids or something, <laughs> you know, with, with Marco. And, oh, yeah, I can imagine. You know, it's, it's sort of like that. So, I mean, especially because the material of the, these first two records, 90% of it was earmarked for Sound of Contact or it was already worked on with Sound of Contact and those, unfortunately, abandoned. But the silver lining is that they're being released this way and, and I'm able to just, you know, soup it up. So, yeah, it'll fit with uh, the Sound of Contact material we're going to perform live. I tend to, I, I will be, you know, won't be doing the whole album because there's not even enough time. There's so many new songs to play. Right. But up uh, favorites from, uh, you know, that, that I had a big hand in writing uh, from Dimension Odd that mean a lot to me. And um, some of the hits, hits quote, you know, yeah. quote, ooh, but, uh, but mostly just about what, you know, connects for me stylistically and fits with the show. And, mm -hmm. yeah. And given your timeline, it sounds like you're planning on these albums being released within about a half year from each other. Are you recording this like, you know, Matrix and Lord of the Rings style, where you're doing both albums at the same time? Yeah, um, I did that for a bunch of reasons. Um, one is uh, w some of the things that I, I, I'm trying to do now to is uh, make up for the long hiatus. Uh, we did Dimension Art in 2010, and um, we, it was released in 2013, which is a long time. And then, and then we started working on the second album in 2015, and it's already 2018. And so it's not a surprise that that whole thing didn't work out. It's just too long. It's yeah. you know. And, uh, but there's a lot of material that I had 
uh, from going back eight years. And I'm just like, you know what? I want to do it. I want to get it done and I want to get it out there without anything getting in the way. And the beautiful feeling. I, I, I'm really, you know, it's bittersweet because I've obviously had big, you know, but we all, Matt and I, and with like, we're heartbroken that that didn't really come to fruition to its full potential, let's say. But we love to mention on, we're proud of it, and it, it's at least it's not tainted with a bad album. It's just one great album, and then okay, that's it, you know. And now we have other outlets. He's got I'm co-producing his solo record, which is has a lot of his material that's built up that was would have been potentially a Sound of Contact songs. And then I've got two albums of material that I want to uh, release. So I'm just amped and excited about it. But the other reason is I wanted the flexibility of, since I, I'm still actually writing the lyrics for it, of putting the different pieces of the puzzle and like, well, maybe this one will go on this album better, and then listening to it with the actual players. So... And the other thing is I had like a momentum going with uh, with Nick DiVirgilio and Marco where I was just like, okay, play this one, play this one, play this one. Uh-uh. And we did like 16 songs with Marco, wow. you know, uh, and, and, and like another five or six with, with Nick so far. And I've got another five or six more to do with him. And it's like when I have that, I can listen to it and put the songs in different order and, and see how the stories flow and – and it just it just helps me do it. And I would imagine when they were making Lord of the Rings and the Matrix, it, it's the same thing. It's like, well, we already have the set built. We already have the actors here. And yes, it costs more money, but it's actually a little bit more practical, uh, you know, to to shoot both, you know, while we already have this all set up. And plus, we can get a little continuity between the two stories, you know. Whereas recreating it later, you might miss some details. So same same thing here. I've got a nice. Uh, continuity between the two albums yet at the same time they are very different sounding from each other which is cool um, and uh, yeah it's just I don't know and plus I, I'm a real freak when it comes to uh, albums I, I'm just every album I do whether it's released this way or not has two full CDs of music there it's just you know to New World was released that way Static, I'm doing a static volume two for that other album material. It's a little different. A mm-hmm. little, little more like Endless River would have been if it was put with uh, as, a, as the big spliff with the Division Bell. A little bit more like that, yeah, actually, a little more yeah. trippy. Yeah, got it, cool. Uh, and so this one, same thing. It could have, I went back and forth between saying, okay, maybe I'll just release this as a double CD. Mm-hmm. Then I'm like, no, you have two different kind of stories and sounds to them. So... I'm leaning toward just separating them as two albums. Plus, it gives me, it gives people time to digest it, you know, as as well. Because I mean, it's almost a full CD on both of them, and there's a lot of material, you know. And and it would, it needs it's at least like you know, a good five six months to be like, okay, I know that material, and now what else you got for me, <laughs> you know? Kind yeah, of, yeah. Like, Bam! Hours of music again. <laughs> no. Like, ah. Yeah, there's definitely something to be said for digestible amounts that people can appreciate, take in, and right, like you said, then they're ready for more. Yeah. yeah. So it seems like festivals like Cruise to the Edge or Prague Stock and others have been a primary catalyst for musicians to work together and even to form bands. And you've played, I think, with near, nearly all of In Continuum's musicians, maybe except Marco, on this past Cruise to the Edge. Um, do you think In Continuum as a band would exist if you hadn't boarded the ship? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yes, I, actually, I do think it would exist. Maybe not as it, it is uh, lineup-wise. Uh, particularly uh, John Wesley, who I played with in Sound of Contact, and um, I think, you know, and I, I had worked with him on my Sonic Elements project, which is a tribute album project. Uh, we did, he's, he guested on a Rush tribute that's coming out um, and a Pink Floyd tribute, which, and he's just a, a great multi talented musician, very nice guy. Um, and I always felt like we, I never really had the chance to work with him creatively like we could have with Sound of Contact, but it just didn't work out that way. And, uh, and same thing with Randy, and, and, and in the Sound of Contact context, we sort of crossed paths where 
I brought him in and then I was out and, and then he was in it without me. It was really weird. And then, you know, but then nothing was ever made with him in that context. And, and a lot of people were like, Oh, I wonder what that would sound like. You know, so I've wondered myself, maybe other people have wondered that are fans of Sound Contact and saw John Wesley play live with the band and thought, man, this is like a super group. Even, even just having John Wesley there, you know, then from Porcupine Tree with, with that combo was like pretty impressive. We, the first gig we did was opening for Marillion on the Marillion weekend, and they all know John Wesley. And to see that band with the son of Phil Collins and John Wesley and everything, that was just like, wow. Yeah. So I just wanted to work, John. Um, I kind of, I just, you know, reached out to him uh, and said, hey, man, you know, you want to you wanna play with us? And he's he was so cool. And he's like, yeah, let's do it. And we had a lot of fun. And that led to this. So so that part for sure. Um, but as far as working with Matt Dorsey, uh, yeah, I've been doing that. He's a great multi-talented uh, player and writer and you know, I, I, uh, I support him, uh, you know, and, and just, you know, like as a friend and, and, and uh, I just respect him as a musician, as a professional person. Um, so I work with him in, in different capacities already. So and same thing with Randy. Uh, the difficult part was not working with Fernando because mm -hmm. that's been he's just been my Fernando Perdomo. He's just been my main collaborator on my solo stuff. And he's so easy to work with and he's so fast and so multi-talented that like, it's like my security blanket. I'm like, and I, I have, yeah, I've worked with him on in continuum where I'm like, damn, like we need nylon guitar. I bet you Fern can knock this out. And I'm like, sure enough, same day, <laughs> killer nylon guitar string, yeah, string uh, nylon string guitar part. I'm like, ah, oh, it's, I, I could just make all my records with Fernando, but they would all <laughs> sound like, you know, records I made with Fernando. And, um, I really, want to try to preserve in continuum to be a, uh, a platform for some of these other amazing guitar players like Randy and Wes to shine. And also Matt who plays uh, guitar uh, on the album as well. And in addition, of course, bass, uh, um, <clears throat> just because they all have a different style and a different thing that they bring. And it, it's, uh, it shapes it differently. And that's, that's cool. You know, I can always make another Dave Kersner solo record, with Fernando, I even have other projects I can do with Fernando, uh, but he's just a great utility person to go to, and he's such a good friend, and, and so just good attitude. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as the live concerts go, the Dave Kersner band is the first time that you've been in the position of being the front man. So how, how has that role felt for you over the past couple of years? Surprisingly comfortable i say surprisingly because for most of my musical career i was more of a behind the scenes backing vocalist keyboard player when it comes to live shows and then of course in the studio doing you know production and sound design and all sorts of things um and was always very objective about it wanting to produce a singer and feeling like like i wouldn't be able to know objectively if i was liking what I do, I would just sort of do what I do to direct someone else. And then I would have an easier time listening to them and going, okay, now do this, do that, try this, do the, you know, and directing. So, but for, you know, I don't know, I just had a transformation, a huge transformation uh, after the first split with Sound Contact where I was just so hungry and so uh, driven that I just pushed myself in, into the front and just said, you're doing this. Mm. And I've never turned back. I, 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 it, it, I, I've not been nervous about it ever. It's strange, but like, I guess I'm just, I've been so seasoned and experienced in general that as a musician, you know, working with like, you know, heavy duty situations that I just kind of did it. And, and I think probably the, the thing that made it easiest is singing my own words. It's so authentic to me and it feels you know borderline authentic when someone else sings my words which is interesting uh and i don't know if that's an ego thing or if that's just a i don't know like it's your baby you know like those are my words you know so you're like i should sing my words like i have to do it i have to sing my words yeah. and i think there are certain artists like let's say maybe bob dylan or roger waters or you know who aren't necessarily great singers you know but 
they sing their words and it's like, well, yeah, it's, it's, you, you buy it because it's their words and, and they, they know their words. They know what they want to say and how they want to say it. So that's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not as I'm more of a singer, let's say traditional singer, more of the Gilmore style, I'd say than waters per se, although there's a little bit sort of in between, I guess. Uh, and that, I, I guess the fact that I write the words makes me just feel like I have to sing it. And so I sing it with conviction. I sing it with passion and meaning. Uh, that said, I have to admit, I'm not like your traditional front man that runs around the stage and gets everybody into it. I'm, I'm usually stuck behind the keyboard. And unless I strap on a guitar or something, which you're not going to see me do anytime soon, <laughs> I'm kind of stuck. You know, maybe like when I play acoustic guitar, I can move around and kind of interact with the band a little bit. But I'm probably a little bit boring, actually. And fortunately, in my band, I've, I've had people like Fernando Perdomo who just have great stage presence and an antics and things to, and then we've got visuals behind us, you know, so I'm, I'm more like, let's say Pink Floyd, just standing there do, singing the songs and having some sort of other element to entertain. But uh, in, in Continuum, that's one of the benefits of, I, I don't have to be the front man for any sort of ego purposes. It's mainly just for, I enjoy it actually, that's why. Uh, and, and it's, and to sing my words, but, um, Gabriel Agudo is a great front man and he's exactly the sort of person who will run around the stage and get people into it and just be more belting and aggressive and, uh, just a different thing that I like to write for, but, um, and of course he's coming in a few days and the goal for any performance where you're singing uh, someone else's song or someone else's words is to sing it like they are your own. And I, I think that he can because he gets it. He, he knows where I'm coming from stylistically. Uh, he has similar tastes in music. Uh, and that's my job as a producer. Just like a director's job, you may have a great actor, but you have to get the performance out of them. Like, like for instance, Natalie Portman, she's a, she's a great actor. She doesn't look like a great actor in the Star Wars prequels because the directing didn't get that out of her, you know, maybe, or the, the script writing, it sort of looked a little bit awkward and contrived. Whereas other movies like Black Swan or whatever, she's amazing, right? So uh, same thing. My job as producer and songwriter is to get Gabriel's best performance. And that's been my job with, with as a co-producer of Sound of Contact, uh, as a co-producer of Montre Vega or anything is to have that kind of objectivity and direction to be able to say, okay, we, this, we're buying this. This is coming across, and it's nailing it. You know, so it's exciting. Yeah, you're talking about your your lyrics, singing your own lyrics there, and I was thinking in in the song that you wrote, "Hypocrites." I love the concluding lyric where you just say, "We're all hypocrites." Uh, tell us what's behind. Tell us what's behind that line. Well, behind that line is essentially. Uh, the whole album is, is a concept album about us, about all of us, uh, and the uh, truths behind things and the, uh, the obstacles that get in the way of our happiness and all the you know, static uh, interference uh, that exists in, in daily life, in the media, and in, in, in with technology, with, in our own heads, the clutter in our minds. And uh, so hypocrisy in, in abounds. And it, I was just actually thinking about this earlier today where I was even almost tempted to post something. It was like, you know, people like this suck. You know, flaky people suck. And yeah. I thought, wait a minute. I, I'm kind of flaky sometimes too, actually. <laughs> I'm like, I just really judge. I'm like, I, you know, there are a number of things. Like, I even have friends of mine who be like, what are you talking about? You're so flaky. And I'm like, well, I'm not as flaky as this person, though. No, maybe not. But you're still flaky too sometimes. We all are, actually, because we're all hypocrites. We all think we're right. We all think, you know, we're, we're righteous. Uh, we stand on our dirty soapbox, you know, which is like a, a another play on words there with, you know, like our – and, and we preach and we say stuff and not even often realizing that it's like we're guilty of the same things that we criticize others for just in different ways. And and the cool thing about that, the positive, it sounds maybe like it's, you know, depressing. It's like we're all hypocrites. Like, yeah, but once you get past the admitting of that, then you can kind of examine it and go, 
what is it about other people that I don't like that I would like to improve in myself? And that, on another level, can lead to, you know, like let's say you don't like toxic people around you. What about you is toxic? And if you sort of raise your vibration, raise your your whole sort of mode of living and everything, uh, you may find that those kind of people aren't attracted. They're not around anymore. And you, and a whole other sort of group of people that are more compatible and more harmonious with your, your nature, you know, pop up and things sort of change. So, you know, it's an interesting thing about the way we look at the world around us either as something separate and we feel like the victim mm -hmm. or we're part of it and we affect it and we can really just work on ourselves. So, you know, it's a lot of heavy duty stuff. Of course, you can just listen to the songs and not think about any of that, but it's there as a sort of, you know, foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Those kind of cuts. Yeah. I really like that sense of personal responsibility there and just looking back right at, at your own actions and using that as growth. Um, yeah. And, and you're referring to social media there. So most, most people who follow you and your career know that you're pretty active on social media and you interact with fans and you do Facebook live sessions and create a buzz about your upcoming projects. So how do you balance that kind of outreach with also needing to stay focused and be able to actually complete your projects? Um, I must admit that, uh, being holed up in the studio on my own, which I am right now even, um, it's fun to use the technology to have a two-way street of, believe it or not, some company. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what social media really is, is kind of like we have company from all over the world and people that want to talk about what we want to talk about. That's actually something interesting that, that before uh, internet and social media – you only had the local people, and if you didn't find anybody who loved Genesis like you did, or you loved Progressive Rock, or wanted to chat about, you know, uh, Infinity War or whatever, you know, you were just kind of like this outcast nerd who like, you know, Star Wars or something. And I mean, there was always somebody, but mm -hmm. not the like hundreds and thousands of people that you find on the internet. You can talk about anything, anywhere with anyone about anything you want. So I mean, it's really cool. So with obviously with uh, friends and fans who would be on my page, they have a natural interest in what I might be doing or, or wanting to say. And uh, so they tune in. And, and, and even like some, because uh, I have all sorts of people, um, some you know, sort of famous musicians tune in sometimes too. And I all of a sudden become self conscious. I'm thinking, wait a minute, this thing is just, you know, like, why would they, why would that guy tune in? <laughs> like, she's a lead singer, you know. This band, and I've been like, okay, well, I don't know. And they're curious. And some of them actually come up to me and say, oh, I love watching your live feeds and everything. Because it's fun. We're like, we like to be voyeurs, you know, and, and sort of get a bit of the real. You know, a lot of us are tired of the canned, I am actually, the canned television, you know, condescending, like, hi, well, we're here with the And it's like all just, you know, pff, bullshit. It's you know, all the show, yeah. It's been on their camera in their real environments, that's, that's all of a sudden fresh and interesting. Cause it's like, well, what, what is it like in Dave's studio? What's he, what's he doing? What's he thinking? You know? So, so I'm really open about it and, uh, I don't necessarily, I don't actually ever prepare anything really, which I probably should out of respect to people's time, but I, I'm upfront about it. I just say, look, I don't have anything planned here. I'm not going to do like a little performance for you. You're just going to hang with me and kind of fly on the wall. If you want, you know, uh, you know, click, uh, something else. But um, I think it's kind of fun. But I have to admit, um, I sometimes get wrapped up in it. And then it's like um, a form of procrastination, <laughs> just mm -hmm. like anything else, even like uh, getting stuck kind of uh, browsing the Internet or browsing, especially Facebook and get in the timeline and you start getting sucked into a conversation. And then and especially uh, if you're going to talk about politics with people and things like that. That can be a real energy sucker if you're just frustrated with, you know, even, even recently we had some, some, you know, what, what people will call a troll or whatever, somebody looking for attention and saying something that's kind of rude or whatever. He said something rude about me. Uh, and, you know, saying, you know, just something ridiculous about me. Um, anyway, 
and, and I, I even responded, which, which as an artist, you just, just really ignore that stuff. But I did anyway. And I just said, well, that's not true and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, like tons of friends and fans went to my defense. Like, you should take that back. I just thought to myself, man, you know, it's like Pandora's box. Once you get into one of those spats yeah. or, you know, like who's right. And it's, it's just like, what an energy sucker and a time waster. So, um, you know, I have to kind of discipline myself, I guess, with my time on social media. And I think we all face that challenge really uh, in different ways. Although some of my friends are like, yeah, I'm not on Facebook anymore. I'm like, wow, that's, that's pretty, you know, like what an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of feel like I have to uh, just because that's a, a way to connect and with my music fans especially and also friends and different people that that over the years i wouldn't necessarily know when their birthday was or whatever and, and just can kind of like lightly keep in touch as opposed to never hearing from them unless there's like a high school reunion or something so you know it's there but everyone has to you know find a way to balance it i guess yeah uh, aside from the social media how do you express your political views in your music and lyrics without alienating a portion of your audience. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I've experimented in terms of my posts and I was surprised, for instance, to find as many, uh, let's say, Trump supporters that would be fans of me because I'm, I'm not one to be, I'm not into labels, actually. I think we're brainwashed into, you know, liberal, Democrat, Republican. I just think it's like, why do we separate ourselves by identifying with like opposing groups? We're all just humans on earth. Exactly. So, you know, you know, like religions and, and like a religion, that's a personal belief. So like, believe whatever you want, you know, nobody knows for sure. So, you know, believe whatever you want. And, uh, same thing with, you know, sort of countries. I love people from all over the world uh, with open arms to me. It's just, it's kind of like, well, you know, there's no separation. That's all man-made stuff. That's just, you know, it doesn't necessarily serve us mankind, you know? Um, so, and, um, I forgot what the original question was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering how you express your political views, uh, actually more in the music and lyrics without alienating anyone. I, I remember, you know, sort of posting some, some stuff about how ridiculous Trump is, you know, what embarrassment and everything and, and all these things. And, a, you know, a decent amount of my fans like were upset about it, you know, kind of like, well, he's great. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, great. And I'm like, wow. Why? And of course I never heard a, you know, I mean, so you, you could have this sort of, you know, intellectual sword fight and win, but then your fans, some of them, one of them, one guy was so mad. He's like, I'm going to sell your CD. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> you don't have to tell me about it, you know, but it's like, but it was a good lesson because I thought, you know what, I, I'm not a, that's not my job to be, I mean, I've got my opinion and I'll say it once in a while here and there, but I'm not a preacher. I'm not a uh, politician. I'm not, you know, who, who cares? I'm a musician. I'm an artist. And what I want to say about it, I can say in an artistic, poetic way. And therefore, they can read it one way or they can read it another way. And they can enjoy it. They can skip the song. They can just listen to the music and not even think about the words. You know, and I'm not that specific which means it can also be applied to different people in different situations so like for instance one of the bands that um i've heard several bands you know just sort of do some like anti-trump songs where it was so obvious that like they were practically rhyming trump with dump and whatever it was you're like okay and it sort of felt slightly cheap actually or even like time stamped is like well what happens when he's not president no one cares about him anymore mm. so uh but you know, let's say a song like Millennium Man from Static is generally about, you know, a caricature of someone with an extreme case of a, of a uh, uh, narcissistic personality disorder, which the current president is like the shining example of that with his behavior, you know, uh, putting other people down, boasting about himself. It's undeniable. It's not like a, an opinion. It's just, it's, it's like, well, that's what that is. That's just the character. That's what that is. But, uh, but it's, the song isn't about him. I don't mention Trump. It could also be about, it's about anybody that's like that. It's even about the tiniest part of me that might even be like that or you, uh, that, that has that kind of ego, you know, like boastfulness. 
And uh, but it is about mainly the extreme and the sort of uh, social commentary on how some of those people, like a president of the United States or a huge rap star or a big uh, actor or somebody who has lots of fans, and yet they're a jerk. And it's just kind of ironic that. Uh, we praise people with less than admirable qualities these days, and that's why it's Millennium Man. It's the new hero is some jerk who puts other people down and thinks he's that I'm the best, blah blah blah. Whereas, let's say in past, in the past, it was somebody with more uh, and admirable qualities and virtues, and someone we could look up to, and. You know, so it's a commentary about that in general. It's a great way to say how I feel about it without directly like offending anybody. It's kind of like, well, look, we're just talking about people with personality disorder. You decide who that is and who it isn't. It's yeah. none of my business. <laughs> nice. Um, you publicly publicly share a more positive and humorous approach to life than many musicians share in the public eye. It seems that you trust the universe is working in your favor it seems you know despite the detours and you just enjoy the humor along the way and i'm wondering where does your grounded optimism come from oh i don't know i mean you know life is short and it's the only way to be um you know everything is about perspective so the meaning of your life and everything is up to you how you choose to see it how you color it how you shape your path. And so to me, I like to make the most of life because it, it's limited. So, you know, you, um, the, the more you, I mean, that's not to say I don't have my bad days. Believe me, I do. And I, I don't get stuck in something, but, uh, but ultimately I'm optimistic and look for a way out and look for a silver lining or maybe look at any, this is a nice, uh, sort of flip a way to, to deal with things. You know, anything that bad happens to you always has a value in that it teaches you something. It teaches you what you don't want. It teaches you how not to be, who not to be around, or how not to do things. And that's valuable because it's gone already. The past is dead. It's always gone. At every moment, it's already gone. So now you have now. You always have now. So in the present moment, you can use all that you've learned. And if you're still here and you're still alive and kicking... Isn't that great? You know, so it's a gift. And, and if you remember that and you don't feel sorry for yourself, you don't feel like, you know, like it's all is not lost. It's like, just think about right now. Like, let's say you got huge debt or you, you're going through a breakup. Or if you got all this other stuff, it's like, but right now, are you okay? Can you, can you live? Can you eat? Can you, you know, function? Can you uh, do what you do? Can you write a song? Can you, what can you do? Can you go outside and breathe fresh air? You know, this is a gift. So as long as you maintain that perspective or keep coming back to that, uh, you'll be fine. And if you trust in the process of life, I mean, this is just my philosophy. But if, if you trust in the process of life, if you just if you're like, you know, this sucks, but I trust in the process of life, and I'm just gonna keep on walking. There's an expression: uh, if you find yourself in hell, keep on walking. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's it, really. And always, without fail. Uh, there is a brighter day and there's other things. And then that give you even perspective. I think when you look back and you go, well, you know, like for instance, when sound of contact, when, when I, I was basically pushed out of sound of contact, uh, the first time I was bummed out. I thought, well, how could this be? I, I put so much into this project and, and blah, blah, blah. And I felt, you know, kind of, uh, all sorts of feelings. And yet I have to thank, everyone for that situation even if because it led to me being pushed to do my solo stuff and had that not happened maybe i wouldn't have had the the catalyst i needed to do it so and now i'm really happy like even happier so uh you know everything happens for a reason if you trust in the process of life it'll get you where you want to be and there's so many mysteries to everything to the universe to to whatever to everything to our existence and so the, the, if we humble ourselves and we don't think we know everything and we just think well we don't really know everything but there is something going on that's some kind of matrix or whatever connecting us all and making coincidences and serendipitous things happen and 
you know, an amazing, like, miracles happen working with your heroes and all sorts of things. It's like, I don't know. I don't know what will happen. I just go ahead thinking anything can happen. And that positive outlook has helped me. And I, I like to spread that around to, to help others be empowered. Not, not saying they could do exactly the same things I do and vice versa, but we each have our own path. And if we clear it and just plow ahead with our you know, uh, mission, we'll achieve all sorts of things that make us and others happy. And that's the best you can do in life, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying seeing how that old adage, when one door closes, another opens, how that comes true in your life. And, you know, it's happening right now, it seems, again. You know, you, you were ready to record that you were recording the second Sound of Contact album. Some For some reason that didn't happen, but look, you're in the midst of this uh, epic project with In Continuum, and, and who knows where that's going to take you now. So it's very exciting. Yeah, and even if it's, uh, you know, it's unknown. It could be bigger than Sound of Contact, or it could be not as big. It doesn't, and I was even reading someone's post uh, worrying about me missing the chance for this to be an it band or something. You know, like because of the you know the supergroup aspect of all the players, there's some really hot players, and I'm like, you know, I'm not. That's contrived to me to try to just be the new it band. Mm. I don't care about that. I mean, that's just what what value does that really have? I mean, maybe money that would be nice, but it, but it just you know what it is for me is like I write music and I hear it and I, I want to see it. Like I feel responsible for it to take it to the finish line. And it's been a challenge and a learning experience being in bands. Uh, and I've arrived at this point in my life now where I'm at the helm and it's up to me. Uh, that doesn't mean it's automatic. That means I have to be at my best, but I'm up for the challenge. And that's a gratifying feeling to, uh, to take all these things to the finish line and then put it out there. And to me, it's like in the process, because life is a process, it's already successful. It's not like I do it and I go, okay, where's my freaking Grammy? Where's my uh, Prog Award? Where's my, you know, like uh, whatever? And it's like, you may or may not get it. I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it. For, I might die tomorrow. It's, I don't even know. Like, There's no promise of, of tomorrow for anybody. So I'm doing it and enjoying the process of doing it. And it's already a success to me because every time we listen back to a song and go, Oh, wow, that came out great. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh, oh what a solo, you know, Randy did or whatever. And you're just like, this is great. This, this is, and, and at the end, I know people will connect with it if we're connected with it along the way. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's been cool just watching you post you know, the ad text, like when you had Marco doing drums uh, the other month, you know, and, and we're watching like a 30 second bit and we have no idea what the song is, but we're just seeing him like go to town, just attacking that drum kit. And it's like, oh man, this is just, this is just going to be amazing. And uh, likewise, you know, you posted something from Randy doing guitar or he posted it the other day with an epic guitar solo and and uh, so already, I'm sure, like I feel this, I'm sure a lot of your other listeners do as well, that, that we're part of the process, we're part of the continuum right now, as it's being formed. And, and so it is, we're all in that journey together. And then that's just, that's a fantastic way to go about it, I think. Yeah, thank you. And that, you know, those are teasers. I, I really, there's part of me that wishes I could actually share more, but then I would be spoiling it for the you know, on un 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 opening the, the present, the package, you know, when it's done. So yeah. th there has to be some restraint there, but um, that's fun sharing the teasers and seeing the reaction. I think Marco shared it on his page. And of course he has a lot more active fans and everything. And it was like a hundred thousand views, no, 160,000 views or 200,000 views and like <laughs> thousand shares and, and uh, 10,000 likes. And I'm like, Holy crap. Like this is what happens when you really, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's like a core with people, but, yeah. um, you know, and, and they were loving it and going, what's this, you know? So the curiosity is there and that's exciting too, by the way, is the growing network of people discovering the music because the music's still there. I, I, I just got a message from somebody who was saying, uh, every once in a while, actually I get this message where somebody just discovered one of my records and says something about it 
like you know calls a like a masterpiece or something like that and the other thing and, and i thought oh really okay cool well that's awesome i'm glad it's still being discovered and the other thing i thought by the way for what it's worth i was just thinking like you know i when you work on these things there's entities there's you and then there's the music and to me the music is its own entity and i feel like father the mother you know like of this thing the, mm-hmm. it's your baby okay and yet you want the best for it and it's not and, and it's nice i think i mean i, mean, I might be full of shit when i say this i don't know but but uh, i'm a hypocrite but like uh <laughs> like i want people to praise the music and i'm happy to take be acknowledged for being part of you know a big part of creating that music uh but like when people say, I'd rather hear them say, this album was a masterpiece. I'll even accept that. I'll be like, yeah, fuck yeah. It's, sorry. It is a masterpiece. You know, like great uh, success. But if they say, you're the best keyboard player ever, <laughs> you know, I'm like, nah, dude, come on. Or you're the greatest. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm like, who's the greatest? That's that you can't, you know, like it's not a competition. And, and I, I just almost not rejected, but, you know, I'm, I humbly like, thank them, but it's like, I don't even want to hear that. I don't, need, I don't need to hear I'm great. I just want to know that the music that I was responsible for hit you yeah. in the chest, you know what I mean? And you consider it a masterpiece. That's like the ultimate, uh, co- uh compliment. Yeah. You know, it's like, Oh, you consider it a masterpiece. Like, job done mission accomplished you know what i mean absolutely yeah yeah kickstarter has been such a wonderful vehicle for you what do you think your album output would be like if kickstarter didn't exist would, would you still be able to churn them out like you have the past few years or has that been an integral part again of community and also financial resource to make it actually happen as as quickly as it has it's hard to say because you know that is the path that I took. Uh, I do generally believe that when there's a will, there's a way. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I do, uh, my kind of other life, uh, my other work, is I work in music software and sound libraries with Sonic Reality and IQ Multimedia and other companies. And we create products that allow musicians to be able to make albums on a budget. And so... I, I, I could cut corners and I could make an album myself, even just playing all the instruments on certain songs like uh, like Under Control. I played on New World. I played everything. Uh, and Fernando plays all the instruments on his records and he cuts them very, uh, you know, cost efficiently mm-hmm. uh, on some of the most. So, you know, when there's a will, there's a way, uh, you know, and, and, and even certain people like, let's say, Steve Hackett, who. You know, if you were lucky enough to get him to play in your stuff, if, if you were to hire someone like that, it would be massively expensive unless he's your friend and you trade favors. And in that case, like, you know, we were trading favors where I would play on his thing, he'd play on my thing. Obviously not the same, you know, monetary value there, but it transcends that. So he would have played on it because I helped him out with Genesis Revisited and he wanted to return the favor to revisit it too. Um, and... You know, so certain things would have happened, but I would not have had the budget to uh, record Nick DiVirgilio and Simon Phillips uh, and all the people in the way that I did without Kickstarter. Uh, and and if I had a label deal, they probably wouldn't have been cool with me doing a double CD. Uh, so that wouldn't have existed. It probably just would have been one CD. Right. Uh, and I remember even Dimension on it, there was talk of like, you know, making it shorter. And I remember this sort of scene from Mozart, uh, from uh, Amadeus, the movie, where they said, there's too many notes. And it's like, well, which notes would you cut? And the guy was like, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, well, same thing. It's kind of like sometimes it just, that's what it is. And, you know, you don't really want, uh, let's say, a label or anybody with any power to interfere with what it needs to be. Kickstarter is great for that. You know, it's it's literally like direct to the fans. And that's what they want. I mean, for me, the deluxe edition of New World, which is a two CD version, outsells the single CD like five to one. Yeah. Crazy. That's the more popular version. So, um, yeah. So it just affords you to be able to do more things. And in, in, in my case, I'm very uh, elaborate with my production. I, I sort of aim to 
produce records that are on the level sonically as some of my favorite records that had a major label budget. So, but I, you know, I have some tools and uh, favors to pull and all sorts of in my own studio, which helps um, to um, uh, achieve that between, let's say, raising 20 to 30 grand on Kickstarter uh, for an album and chipping in also myself. So they usually have to pay more than that. Um, you know, but making a record that would cost normally someone over a hundred thousand. Yeah. What's the story for In Continuum? Are you going to do a Kickstarter for that too, or is there another arrangement for that? Uh, I think so. Um, probably. But, um, I, th there's also a timing element of it as well. I, I don't like to have two running at two campaigns running at the same time. I think that's kind of, uh, uh, as the British would say, cheeky. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to deliver Static Live, um, and I had a few hiccups with that, um, but it's coming along a tiny bit late, but not nearly as late as I've been in the past, so relatively not late. But I don't want to start the In Continuum Kickstarter until I've at least delivered the, uh, the digital stuff from that campaign. Um, but, um, yeah, so I mean, there'll be some kind of pre-order at least, and I do want to release it physically as prog stock. So something's likely to happen this summer, either a pre-order or a Kickstarter. I just don't, I don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're renowned for sharing stories about your interactions with legendary musicians uh, from your previous world with IK Media, and it, could you share one brief Squid's Tale with us here? Well, sure, yeah. In fact, uh, I mean, there's just so many of those, but uh, one of them that comes to mind, let's say if you want to talk about the farm, is the farm is Genesis Studio in Surrey, England. Um, it's um, where they've recorded a bunch of records like uh, Abacab and everything since then, actually. Um, and I'm friends with Nick Davis, who mixed uh, Dimension Out for us and uh, mixed... Uh, all the box sets for Genesis and uh, co-produced uh, a bunch of their records. Um, and also worked, so I worked with Nick Davis there on some sample sessions and Hugh Padgham, uh, who produced um, Phil Collins and Genesis and The Police and Sting and all sorts of great people, XTC, both of them actually did. Uh, and so those are great mentors you know, uh, in terms of just doing sessions with them, sampling drums and whatnot, uh, and just seeing how they work and how they get sounds and talking with them, picking their brain. Um, oh, wow, I just realized I forgot I was supposed to get together with Tom Lord Algae. I knew I was forgetting something. He's an engineer who works here, uh, and he had a little bit of time, and I was like, I, I need to I keep a better calendar. Just remembered. Anyway, um, but th these are uh, guys who've made tons of records as a producer, as an engineer, uh, and um, I that side of me, I'm just very fascinated with their techniques and uh, their their the way they do things. So, you know, it's not really an exciting story, I, I guess, uh, but you know, it was fantastic. And you know, it, one of the things actually that was really cool about working at the farm. Uh, doing sample sessions was um, because it, it was a brief period of time where they were renting it out to people outside of Genesis and they stopped doing that. And, um, but there was just like a few years of that. And I, I think I was the first one to do it. And I think I was the last one to do it. Not, not that I was the reason they stopped, but they huh. stopped. They sold off the cottage that was there and the, the business itself where they were just like, it just wasn't working uh, doing it in a public studio for them. But um they had me in there, and when if you did book the studio, you could rent any of the keyboards and guitars and stuff in the warehouse, and it literally was like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame legendary gear back there that Genesis used. So you could like grab uh, Mike Rutherford's double neck, you know, that he used on Selling England on the, by the Pound or the Lamley Sound on Broadway. There's different ones, nice. a Rick Rucker and a Micro Frets, and then a Shergold. They use later, or you could grab any of Tony's keyboards, his ARPs, his, and, and use it on your session. It's like the back line. It's unbelievable. It was crazy, you know, especially if, if you know the history of these instruments. Uh, so I pulled out almost every single one and sampled them, you know, released it as a sample library for musicians to use. 
uh, with Nick Davis is a sort of, uh, you know, Nick Davis farm sessions collection, um, along with the drums that we sampled, but that was just amazing. Just pulling out, you know, one of Tony Banks keyboards and playing it. And, and, and especially like playing, um, Mike Rutherford's double necks, you know, cause I don't really play those instruments, but just to hold it in my hands, I was like, Oh, wow. um, you know, felt the energy. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, sweet. Well, I want to remind our listeners that uh, the In Continuum Band is going to be making their debut at Prague Stock first weekend of October in New Jersey. So be sure to get your tickets for that. You've been hearing all about it during this interview, and it sounds like it's going to be a really exciting album release coming up. So be sure to see that debut. I think, Dave, you're going on on the Friday night, I believe, that the festival opens or is that right yeah we uh are the second to last band i think to play on friday night mm -hmm. so we're playing at five or six somewhere in there yeah and and on that date uh, marco's gonna be with you on drums too that's the plan right on <laughs> yeah we should have marco on drums which is exciting we haven't officially announced that but uh that's an exciting announcement it's pretty much you know the plan right now but he's just come, coming off a tour with the aristocrats so we have to fly him there and, and just make sure it works because uh, he's going to be in europe but uh that's that's that, i think that's what's happening there and then we'll have randy mcstein and uh gabriel gudo and uh, matt dorsey myself i think fernando perdomo is going to be guesting with us that's uh sweet. depending on whether Wes is able to make it mm -hmm. uh, on that gig west will be joining us for Cra uh, cruise of the edge though so, um, but yeah, and, and we have a few other surprise guests, uh, for, uh, Prague stock specifically, uh, because like you mentioned earlier, you know, these festivals, I love festivals like Prague stock because, uh, you know, there's so many great musicians there. And last time when we played Prague stock, Francis Dun Dunnery, my good friend from it bites and Robert plants band was there. So, uh, he sang some songs from the landmines down on Broadway, Peter Jones from Tiger Moth Tales sang with us, a Kevin Gilbert song. I know you love Kevin Gilbert, and yeah. you and I got to do a Kevin Gilbert song on Chris the Edge. That was fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so, you know, when in Rome, you know, there's always something special about these events that's only going to happen then. So uh, I, I, I'm sure this new Prog Stock, uh, second year in a row, one of the best festivals around, um, is going to be no exception. It's going to be, there's going to be some stuff that happens then that will never happen again. Yeah, that's what I always appreciate so much about you and making the most of collaborating with different people who are there for those special one-offs that, you know, just stay with you forever. I mean, I'm always going to remember the uh, Greg Lake tribute that you did on the cruise and doing the whole In, in the Court of the Crimson King with all those guests. Uh, just unbelievable. Uh, so uh, people coming to Prague Stock, you can definitely count on, on a one-of-a-kind experience, so don't miss it. And Dave, thanks so much for talking with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this interview with Dave Kurtzner. Glad to have you here with us. And we invite you to stay updated with all of the upcoming interviews and concert reviews that we've got here at Sonic Perspectives. So please go to our Facebook and Twitter pages and like those. And we want to leave you with a track from Dave Kurtzner. This is one of the ones that features Steve Hackett guesting on guitar on his static album, this is Dirty Soapbox.
preacher Staring through the corner 